Hello everyone from the very dystopian capitalist authoritarian monarchy of the United Kingdom. And speaking of capitalism, capitalism really knows no borders. It is spread all around the world. And today we are going to be talking about capitalism in relation to Japanese vending machines. Now, this is a video I have wanted to make since I got back from Japan like just over a month ago. And I was really fascinated by the vending machines. I really like the vending machines. I'm going to speak about all of that a bit later. But one thing I noticed about most of the vending machines is they contained mainly caffeinated drinks. And it got me thinking even more about how convenient Japan is. And as a tourist, it's amazing. Convenience stores, vending machines. But then I was thinking about, like, what is this in the service of? What is an efficient society, a convenient society, in the service of, in a capitalist system? And it reminds me of how I used to feel about UBI, when people like Elon Musk would talk about it. And I'm like, why the hell does someone like Elon Musk want UBI? He wanted UBI as, like, a general subsidy for consumer capitalism, because he is in the business of, like, a consumer product, electric cars for example and i think that is also the dark side of the japanese society now this is basically like my own hypothesis because i was trying to read has anyone said this about convenience stores and vending machines in japan and it seems like no one has so basically i do want to talk about vending machines in japan i do want to talk about japanese work culture but i also really want to focus on caffeine and mainly coffee as a stimulant that really helps capitalism survive and how our general addiction to coffee and caffeine is extremely helpful to the capitalist class because it makes us more efficient and it makes us more energetic but in many instances it's pretty bad for our health and I'm going to talk about my own experience as a wagey myself drinking coffee at work in an office up London and I just think it's going to be a fun video and we're going to talk about a lot of things. But before you go any further, please like the video. And in the comments, I'm actually going to read you an Ask UK Reddit thread in a sec. How much coffee do you drink every day? Coffee connoisseurs, you're going to be quite horrified at my own answer. I drink two small coffees a day and it's basically two little spoonfuls of basically whatever instant coffee I can find mixed with this low calorie hot chocolate. So I don't actually drink proper coffee. Pretty much I drink hot chocolate with a bit of coffee in it, which is a mocha. But I think that's a good thing, to be honest, because it means I don't actually drink a load of coffee. And as I'm going to show you in about a minute, some people's coffee consumption is crazy. Like, I cannot even imagine drinking this much. But let me know down in the comments. I hope you don't drink too much, just because if you are drinking loads, as we're going to explore in this video it's probably a symptom of capitalist work culture. But also, follow me on social media, at The Cavernacle on Twitter, but especially on Instagram. Instagram is where I posted about all my travels around Asia, and that includes Japan. I actually separated it by day. I think I have like eight separate highlight reels for Japan and Korea. So if you're interested in what I got up to in Japan, go check that out. Also consider becoming a patron. I just uploaded my first podcast on this channel, actually, and half of that is going to be exclusive for patrons. Other benefits include my Discord server, my Switch friend code, a couple videos on the Patreon page about my travels around Asia, and I'm trying to build up as many $1 to $3 patrons as possible. So if you care about any of that stuff, go check out the Patreon, and also check out my second channel where the podcast will be for the public, and also check out my subreddit, all of those things down in the description. So before we talk about anything Japan related, anything vending machine related, I think we have to talk about coffee and mainly my relationship with coffee. So I'd never touched coffee until university and even then I didn't drink it because I would maybe have a Starbucks Frappuccino if I went out on my girlfriend but that's not even like a real coffee and I never ever really drank it. I used to just drink hot chocolate on its own as like a warm drink. But in 2019, I got my first full-time corpo office job in central London. And also, because I noted in the podcast, I did YouTube in my spare time. I exercised. I played a lot of football, including on weeknights. So I didn't sleep much. And this was my first experience of relying on coffee to actually function because I was sleeping like 
four hours every night, maximum five and a half hours. So every day at work, I needed coffee to function. And I remember saying to my manager, who was like my only friend at work as well, I said, I have to drink this. And how dystopian is it? I have to take this basically legal drug stimulant to actually function because this job and the commute, which equals like 55 hours a week out of my time, is really meaning I have no time to do anything else unless I forsake my own sleep, which I did. And in that, I was thinking about everyone who was drinking coffee in the office. I was like, we are all drinking this. And like I said, I'm a guy until I was like 24 years old, I didn't drink coffee pretty much ever. I didn't rely on energy drinks. I didn't need it. And now here I am in a situation where I have to drink like two coffees a day. And I guess what I would drink is like one coffee drink from like the shop. So like, I think it's called Polar Coffee or something. It has a Polar bet on it. Forgot what the name is. And then maybe like one instant one mix of hot chocolate if I brought it in. And then I have basically two a day. And that doesn't even sound bad because lots of you are thinking, oh, two a day. That isn't bad. And that's kind of like what I have right now as well. And today I've had one small one. I'm probably going to have a larger one when I'm editing this video tonight. But like I said, capitalism, neoliberalism, all this stuff, it made me a coffee drinker. I needed coffee. I didn't even like coffee when I started drinking it, but I needed it. And this is what has really interested me about this topic because I'm like, surely I'm not alone. Before we go any further, this is pretty staggering to me. There was a thread on Ask UK saying coffee drinkers, how many coffees do you typically have each day? And this person says, I drink two a day, one with breakfast, one after lunch, which is fairly reasonable. It sounds like me. But then some people in this, I can't even believe this. So um, far too much. Free before 8 a.m. Steady coffees until 3 p.m. Free before 8 a.m. I used to get out really early for work, like 6.20, 6.30. The thought of drinking free coffees before I've even set out the door literally gives me a headache just thinking about it. Other ones, I have between six and eight a day. I brew three to four pots and each has two cups. I can't even imagine drinking that much. Used to be a nine to 10 sort of person, but the doctor told me off five to six and a couple of teas. Four double espressos a day is my average. Six to eight at weekends. That is an insane amount of coffee. And why I know that even more is I accidentally drank three triple espressos in like 32 hours because basically after work, I'd sometimes have five aside league football straight away. So I just down a monster espresso drink, not realizing how much caffeine it had in it. So by like Wednesday that week, I was sweating so bad. And I'm like, why am I sweating so bad? And I realized I accidentally drank that much. The thought of drinking four doubles a day and potentially Eight. I'm hoping he means spaced out over the weekend, but that is pretty insane, to be honest. At work, probably eight to ten coffees. Somewhere between six and eight. Six mugs before 10 a.m., then no caffeine the rest of the day. Six mugs of coffee before 10 a.m. I drink two to three, 500 mil cups a day, fair enough. Considerably less than the 20 to 30, 250 mil cups I used to drink. And that just, like blows my mind that we can even tolerate that much caffeine like people say a lot about energy drinks but some of those people drinking that much coffee far worse for you than energy drinks but a lot of people obviously rely on energy drinks too for the same effect and what causes us to drink so much coffee it's not because we're chilling and enjoying it it's because people are addicted to coffee and they get addicted in my opinion based on the capitalist work week and basically not having the luxury of either treating your sleep schedule with respect and getting enough sleep or just being insanely overworked and that is where japan comes into it because i'm talking about myself i used to work 40 hours a week about 15 hour commuting time for the week as well so very very long hours but obviously i don't work in japan where there often is longer hours and more pressure to actually stay at your job to save face and actually more pressure to not take any work days off because of like societal pressure, work company culture and stuff. So now let's talk about Japanese vending machines. Before talking about what coffee actually does to us, its relationship with the capitalist work week, before talking about Japanese work culture. So like I said, I went to Japan, I went to Tokyo, I went to Kyoto, I went to Osaka. And in Tokyo especially, the amount of vending machines everywhere 
is just so, so staggering. And I do know like you can get loads of stuff out of vending machines, but what I noted, because I'm someone who likes Monster Energy and was on the lookout for this one tiny can of Monster Energy, which I actually found in the end. Do you not know work? Mm. Yeah, it works. Yummy. <laughs> so, I looked everywhere for Monster Cubed. Don't know what it is. It tastes like, it smells like original monster. <laughs> it just tastes like original, but really strong. But it turns out I was actually in a lot of them, is that when I was looking at the drinks in the vendor machine, pretty much all of them were coffees, they were energy drinks, they were monster. And when I was going around Japan, like I said, convenience stores, very good at giving you actually a pretty good meal if you want to. And then I was obviously getting the train, public transport is really good. And I'm just thinking about, wow, what a wonderful country for all these nice things I can have. But then the dark side of my mind was turning where I was thinking, oh, like, this is very convenient. But I know some stuff about Japanese capitalism, which makes me not think about these in a completely positive light. But before we get on to like that side of things, I want to talk about like, the kind of economics of the vending machines anyway, kind of removed from what I'm talking about, about how a lot of these things seem to me to be in the service of capital and capitalist work weeks by making the access to a stimulant that helps you work longer so readily available literally every single place you go in a city like Tokyo. So just two articles I wanted to just quickly reference, one on the Telegraph and one on Business Insider. So what's behind Japan's vending machine obsession? Where does this love affair come from? Some speculate that the roots of Japan's obsession with vending machines can be traced back to 17th century Edo era when itinerant merchants carried around eclectic array of daily goods from noodles to medicine to sell directly to communities. However, the invention of the vending machine is widely attributed to Percival Everett, who developed a coin-operated device in London in 1883, which was installed in stations and dispensed postcards. Japan wasn't far behind. Just five years later, Tara Rea Koshichi, a furniture artisan and inventor, created the nation's first vending machines, which also sold postcards and stamps. Its mechanical structure was similar to the traditional Japanese mechanized puppet dolls known as karakuri. But it wasn't until the 1950s that the popularity of the vending machine began to soar, with numbers multiplying every year. The quantity of vending machines in Japan peaked at 5.6 million around 2000, or one for every 22 people. But competition from the rise of 24-hour convenience stores stemmed its popularity and numbers have slipped slightly since. Despite the decline, it's still hard to imagine a Japanese street without them, particularly as a new high-tech generation has cropped up across the country in recent years. But going on, they say, there are many reasons why the machines have thrived in Japan. Minimal running costs compared to a physical store, round-the-clock convenience, low street crime rates, and the fact Japan is still a very much cash-based society. Some experts have also pointed to the preference among some Japanese to avoid the stress of human interaction of any kind, particularly when working long, intense hours, and instead embrace the simplicity of using a machine. So I do like how the Telegraph has referenced that they work long and intense hours, but I still couldn't find any work on the link between caffeine and capitalism in Japan specifically, so that's what this video is. But just following on from that, an insider talking about why they like it so much. So the cost of labor is one reason. Japan's declining birth rate, aging population, lack of immigration have contributed to make both labor scarce and costly. Robert Parry, an economics lecturer at Kobe University, also pointed to high labor costs as a reason Japanese retailers have so enthusiastically embraced vendor machines in his 1998 essay. So another economic reason is high population density and expensive real estate. With a population of 127 million people in a country roughly the size of California, 
Japan is one of the most population dense countries in the world, particularly when you consider about 75% of Japan is made up of mountains. 93% of Japanese population lives in cities. The population density has unsurprisingly led to high real estate prices for decades, forcing city dwellers to live in apartments that would make New York apartments feel spacious. Though urban land prices dropped during Japan's economic decline in the 1990s, they've gone back up. High population density and higher real estate prices has meant that Japanese people don't have a lot of room to store consumer goods and that Japanese companies would rather stick a vending machine on the street than open up a retail store. Vending machines produce more revenue from each square meter of scarce land than a retail store can provide, Parry concluded. So in terms of economics, in terms of capitalism, vending machines make sense to Japanese companies selling certain goods because you can just stick a bunch of them on street corners, you can stick a bunch of them in parks, you can stick them basically anywhere, don't have to pay anyone for the labor, don't have to pay as much real estate. I don't know what you'd be paying for just sticking a vending machine somewhere. I assume they're paying, you know, something. To but yeah, like I said, to sell as much products as possible. But of course, something they're also missing in this article is why would people want vending machines so much as well to sell caffeinated drinks? Why would these vending machines be so successful in the first place in their convenience? And like I've been talking about, coffee is what people need to work. So many of you people will completely resonate with that statement right there. It happened to me. It happened to so many people. And it is basically a legalized stimulant drug to make sure you can keep working for as long as possible. So although this might not be some conspiracy from the ruling class in Japan, let's just put 7-Elevens, family marts everywhere. Let's put vending machines everywhere so people won't complain that they don't have time to cook that they don't have time to go just get a coffee from a shop, they don't have time to chill in a coffee shop. Let's make this so convenient for them so no one complains. And before we start talking about the grueling working conditions of being like a Japanese laborer, especially in the corporate environment, I wanna talk about both what coffee does to your brain and also the capitalist history of coffee and the work week, because I think this is very, very interesting. So from an article in The Atlantic called Capitalism's Favorite Drug, the dark history of how coffee took over the world. Coffee keeps us awake, it keeps us alert, it lends our work habits a machine-like efficiency in the kind of unwitting critique born only of unreserved enthusiasm. Margaret Meager, author of To Think of Coffee in 1942, aptly named the function of coffee today. Coffee has expanded humanity's working day from 12 to a potential 24 hours, the tempo, the complexity, the tension of modern life, call for something that can perform the miracle of stimulating brain activity without evil habit-forming after effects. Although I would say, as you saw from our Ask UK thread, I do think people have become addicted to caffeine. But going on, so coffee owes its global ascendancy to a fortuitous evolutionary accident the chemical compound that the plant makes to defend itself against insects happens to alter human consciousness in ways we find desirable, making us more energetic and industrious, and notably better workers. That chemical, of course, is caffeine. Along with the tea plant, which reduces the same compound in its leaves, coffee has helped create exactly the kind of world that coffee needs to thrive, a world driven by consumer capitalism, ringed by global trade, and dominated by a species that can now barely get out of bed without it. The effects of caffeine mesh with the needs of capitalism in a myriad of ways. Before the arrival of coffee and tea in the West in the 1600s, alcohol was the drug that dominated and fogged human minds. This might have been acceptable, even welcome, when work meant physical labor performed outdoors, but alcohol's effects became a problem when work involved machines or numbers, as more and more of us did it. Enter coffee, a drink that not only was safer than beer, but turned out to improve performance and stamina. In 1660, only a few years after coffee became available in England, one observer noted, "'Tis found already that this coffee drink hath caused a greater sobriety among the nations, whereas formerly apprentices and clerks with others used to take their morning's draught of ale, beer, or wine, which, by the dizziness they cause in the brain, made many unfit for business, 
they use now to play the good fellows in this wakeful and civil drink. This wakeful and civil drink also freed us from the circadian rhythms of our bodies, helping to stem the natural tides of exhaustion so that we might work longer and later hours. Along with the advent of artificial light, caffeine abetted capitalism's conquest of night. It's probably no coincidence that the miniature hand on the clocks arrived at roughly the same historic moment as coffee and tea did, when work was moving indoors and being reorganised on the principle of the clock. So, just a bit more on the science of it, caffeine directly affects our central nervous system, and the initial effects of caffeine range from improved focus, energy and mood, to an increased heart rate and blood pressure, as well as frequent urination and gastrointestinal upset. As caffeine contains no nutritional value, it works by borrowing energy from your future self by blocking brain receptors responsible for tiredness. While convenient in the short term, in the long run, this will result in poorer deep sleep quality and increased fatigue. Moreover, as with any drug, if used regularly, the human body gradually develops a tolerance to it, meaning that more caffeine is required over time to achieve the same effect. Coffee is so accessible that on average in the UK, approximately 95 million cups of coffee are consumed each day. And this figure doesn't include tea, supplements, or energy drinks. So the reality of nationwide caffeine use is truly staggering. Worldwide, it's estimated that over 80% of the population consumes caffeine on a daily basis. Why hasn't the government cracked down on caffeine use? The answer is both straightforward and controversial. Without caffeine, there would be no capitalism. Regardless of where you sit on the political spectrum, most of us can agree that working 40 hours a week, often in mind-numbing jobs, requires some sort of chemical stimulation. The human brain, simply put, isn't built for the demands of modern-day capitalism. So I like those articles a lot because it just highlights a lot of what I've been saying, is that we need caffeine to function in, I guess, neoliberal capitalism because, like I've experienced, like many of you experience, working 40 hours a week is both pointless to actually getting the work done because it's way too much time to be sitting at your desk but also just boring as hell like I'd regularly find myself at work just being like I'm so bored right now I would literally rather stare at this wall or just lean back on my chair thinking of something than doing this work right now and this is a job that I found fairly interesting as well I was covering like the pharmaceutical industry for like a business magazine like it wasn't the most boring thing in the world but even I was so bored. And obviously some of you will have way more boring jobs than that. And you need it to get through a day. You need it because your brain can't handle the boredom of this. But I also like that little anecdote about the emergence of coffee in the workplace replacing beer. And how it made people like more sober and civil and made them basically more awake. And obviously from that you can probably sense that there's no wonder the capitalist class wanted us all to drink coffee. But there's actually a really funny story in America about how the coffee break kind of got introduced and how it became like a paid break as well because originally people weren't paid for coffee breaks. And I find this really interesting because I think it says so much about why people want us to drink caffeine so much and why in Japan vending machines mostly just have caffeinated drink. So going back to that Atlantic article. So the story of a small Denver necktie maker called Lost Wigwam Weavers. When the company lost its best young male loom operators to World War II in the early 1940s, the owner, Phil Greennets, Greennets, hired older men to replace them, but they lacked the dexterity needed to weave the intricate patterns in the wigwam's ties. Next, he hired middle-aged women, and while they could produce ties to his standards, they lacked the stamina to work a full shift. When Greenitz called a company-wide meeting to discuss the problem, his employees had a suggestion. Give us a 15-minute break twice a day with coffee. Greenitz instituted the coffee breaks and immediately noticed a change in his workers. The women began doing as much work in six and a half hours as older men had done in eight. Greenitz made the coffee breaks compulsory but he decided he didn't need to pay his workers for the half an hour they were on break. This led to a suit from the Department of Labor and eventually to a 1956 decision by Federal Appeals Court that enshrined the coffee break in American life. 
the court ruled because the coffee breaks promote more efficiency and result in a greater output, they benefit the company as much as the workers and should therefore be counted as work time. As for the phrase coffee break, it entered the vernacular through a 1952 advertising campaign by the Pan American Coffee Bureau, a trade group organized by Central American growers. Their slogan, give yourself a coffee break and get what coffee gives to you. I like that story of the origins of the American coffee break in that he's like, yeah, isn't this so great? Like they can all drink coffee and they're so much better workers. I'm such a greedy capitalist. I'm going to push this even further. I'm not just satisfied they're making me more profit and making me more revenue. I'm actually not going to pay them for these breaks either, despite the fact that they are mandatory. I think that just says so much about <laughs> the capitalist mindset that they have to keep making money no matter what. They cannot be happy with something they've discovered to increase efficiency. It's like, how do I uh, shortchange my workers even more? How do I steal my workers' labor value even more than I already have, even though I'm making them take this like stimulant to make them better workers as well. But capitalism means we really can't have anything nice. And in this video, I'm just talking about coffee consumption. If you read about the history of coffee plantations, it is some of the most brutal colonialism or authoritarianism in the world. Just like the history of tobacco and sugar, it really is depressing that so many ingredients that go into nice things we consume are made with really unethical practices like chocolate as well and what they actually are used for intentionally or not is to make us better wage slaves and make our employers even more profit but on that note let's take this all back to japan because like i said vending machines lots of caffeine we've seen examples for the uk where so many people drink coffee every day like most of the population seem to drink caffeine every day and we've seen the origins of coffee breaks entering the Western, I guess, work week as well. But in the UK, sometimes getting coffee can be inconvenient. I used to bring stuff like this into my office, had to buy it at the shop. You could maybe go to a coffee shop nearby, but that would be expensive a lot of the time, especially in central London. Or like me, you'd go to a Tesco and buy like the cheapest iced coffee thing you could find. But in Japan, you don't really have those problems because if you go to a vending machine, you can get a pretty big, nice coffee for like one pound normally. And they're normally decent size as well. And of course, some of them are actually warm, which is kind of cool as well. And there are so many convenience stores, like literally everywhere. And that is obviously what prompted the video idea in the first place, is that I started thinking, it feels like the convenience is to facilitate capitalism. And I feel that even more than other places when we actually talk about Japan's brutal work culture. Now, they have taken steps to reform it, but a lot of it is peer pressure. A lot of it is, don't take your holiday days because it makes you look bad in front of everyone else, or people will start blaming you for actually taking a break from work. So why I did a good article, and it was mainly talking about how other countries have not taken this seriously in increasingly making people work harder and longer. So Japan's Kiroshi culture was a warning, and we didn't listen. Not so in Japan, which coined the name for this problem, Kiroshi, which literally means death by overwork after the 1973 oil crisis triggered widespread workplace restructures, reports emerge of worker fatalities, most often from heart failure or stroke. Most victims worked long hours, sometimes 60 or 70 hours per week or more, in the lead up to their death. Since then, pressure on workers has continued to mount. Irregular worker numbers in Japan are up from 10% in 1990 to 40%, while those on full-time regular contracts do not feel able to quit, no matter how intolerable work becomes. The government accepts around 200 workplace injury claims for Kiroshi annually, but campaigners have put the toll at around 10,000 deaths. Makoto Iwahashi of the labour rights organisation POSSE says victims' families have been instrumental in raising awareness of Kiroshi, People know that there is a risk that you're going to die if you work long hours, which wasn't common sense 30 or 20 years ago. In 2018, Shinzo Abe, RIP, presented the Work Style Reform Bill, which meant employers could be forced into compelling employees to take holiday, a response to the 50% take-up of paid leave. But other gaps in the law enabling chronic overwork were allowed to continue. For the first time, a cap was introduced on overtime, but it was set perilously high 
at 80 hours a month on top of an eight hour day that averages to 60 hour weeks of overtime. The Japanese government recognizes that more than 80 hours of overtime a month as a risk factor for Kuroshi, yet it only made it legal to work up to that line. It introduced an exemption for special months of 100 hours overtime to be sought at employees' discretion. The government is saying, if you work to this threshold when you could die, but you can work to this threshold. But at present, there are next to no penalties for violations by companies and only around 3,300 labour inspectors to keep track of Japan's 6 million companies. Employers are not even required to keep a record of employees working hours and most don't. So like I was saying at the start of the video, I haven't seen much work done between the relation of caffeine and Japan's insane working culture, but I read you there that overworking still continues. You can go up to the threshold, which can usually trigger things like Kuroshi, and here's something to consider. How many people who die at work from this stress, from the overworking, how many of them do you think are drinking an insane amount of caffeine? And how has Japanese society with the vendor machines like facilitated this culture as well? Like, I'm not saying it's responsible for overworking, but how do people work 80 hours a week? How can you even function? I know it's a bit of a joke and a meme in like the restaurant industry that chefs, for example, have to take illegal drugs to actually stay functioning. But if you're working 80 hours a week, you probably need that caffeine. I would say it's guaranteed you need this amount of caffeine and that's why Japan's convenience can help facilitate this culture. And I'm not saying Japan has to get rid of it. You can have this convenience and have a better working culture. But I'm saying they kind of go hand in hand in that if you work people harder, if you work people longer hours, then they're going to need more caffeine, this stimulant. They're going to need this. And if you have vending machines everywhere, it's going to be very profitable for the people who own that. But it's also kind of like self-fulfilling because if they have the caffeine they'll drink more caffeine and then they'll be more productive at work. And if they're working longer hours and being more productive because of caffeine, then why would there be any crackdown on overconsumption of caffeine or working longer hours? And I just think it's kind of like dystopian how so many of us feel like we can't survive without coffee. I actually quit coffee when I was working my 8.30 to 5.30 job at the end because I had bad neurological problems anyway. And I felt like coffee was exacerbating them because of, you know, being a brain stimulant. I don't think it did, but I did survive for a bit. But life was just so, so hard. I feel like Japan and obviously Korea are good examples of this. But it just so happens that Japan is the country where you go. And you're just like, I cannot believe how many vending machines are everywhere selling me monster energy, selling me boss coffee, selling me teas and everything like that. And like I said, as a tourist... It's amazing. You can have a nice day in the city and if you just feel like a drink at some point, just go get one. It'll be right there. If you want a sandwich, it'll be right there. So convenient. Very convenient subway. It gets me everywhere. But we are foreigners to Japan. We don't work up to 80 hours a week and we don't feel like we need constant access to caffeine and coffee all the time. But in my hypothesis, that's what it feels like with Japan. Like I said, very nice for the tourists, but when you kind of peel back the layers of Japanese work culture and society, it feels like vending machines are a bit of a monument to something a bit more sinister. It doesn't have to be that way, of course, but like I was reading you with the stats for the UK, showing you how much UK people drink coffee and stuff. Someone saying they drink 20 to 30 cups of coffee. Would they drink that much coffee if they weren't overworked? Would they drink that much coffee if we didn't live under a capitalist system which prioritizes profit efficiency absolutely destroying each other as human beings to get to the top we need these things otherwise we will not succeed in the brutal system of capitalism and it seems like in certain countries you won't even survive if you don't have access to this so anyway again like i said this isn't like a conclusive thing there's like no academic work done on this link i just thought it was interesting to think about vendor machines in relation to Japanese work culture and also the history of coffee in the capitalist workplace and blend it all together and come to this conclusion. But I'm interested in what you guys think, especially if you grew up in Japan or Korea or if you've worked for Korean or Japanese companies. I'd be very interested to know. And that is it for the video. Let me know what you guys think 
down in the comments. And if you made it this far, thank you for watching.